Hi, welcome back to Dr. Donovan, Medicine Made Easy. In today's video, I'm going to be explaining the medical procedure for how to drain a peritonsillar abscess, which is commonly known as a Quincy. I'm going to be covering everything I think you'll need to do to do the procedure safely and effectively based on my own personal experience. I've also linked important training resources in the description box of this video, so please check those out. Before I start, I want to stress that this video is intended as an educational resource for trained and licensed healthcare professionals. I cannot stress enough that you should not attempt this at home. If you're a patient and suspect that you might have a Quincy, please see your nearest healthcare professional who can assess you fully. So I'm now going to switch to presentation mode and in this video I'm assuming some prior background knowledge and that's that you've taken a detailed history from the patient and that you've thoroughly examined the patient and that you've got a high clinical suspicion of a Quincy. It might initially be difficult to examine the mouth if there's significant trismus which you can see in this photo here. Trismus is essentially the medical word for someone who is unable to open their mouth fully. In this case, you want to admit the patient, give them some IV treatment and re-examine them later. And the initial treatment can improve your view. A good starting point when you're admitting patients who you suspect have a Quincy is to get IV access and then you can take blood, so things such as a full blood count, user knees, LFTs and a glandular fever screen, so something like a monospot. You want to make sure that you've given the patient appropriate pain relief, so this can be things such as paracetamol. If they're able to swallow, you can give it orally. If not, you want to give IV and analgesia. You then want to give some topical analgesic spray, so things such as benzodiamine spray, and then you also want to give IV fluids such as, you know, a litre of Hartmann's or um, a litre of sodium chloride. Usually these patients are quite dehydrated and giving them things such as fluids as well as a single dose of steroid IV, so usually IV dexamethasone 6.6 milligrams will make them feel much better. But the ultimate treatment and um, management of a Quincy is going to be drainage. And I'm going to discuss two different types of drainage technique in this video. One is aspiration using a needle and the other is incision and drainage. If you've decided that the patient has a Quincy and there's a high clinical suspicion, you first of all want to explain the procedure that you're going to be doing to the patient and gain consent. I prefer to get written consent where possible. And as part of this consent process, you should explain the potential complications to the patient. And these are things such as aspiration of blood, bleeding and pain, infection, potential but low risk of puncture to the carotid artery and incomplete drainage of the abscess. If the patient's happy to go ahead with the procedure and has the capacity to weigh up the risks and the benefits, then you can proceed. So in terms of equipment that you're going to need, you want to get local anaesthetic spray, so you can get 1% lidocaine with epinephrine. You can then also get topical anaesthetic spray, which is going to be helpful, so for example 4% lidocaine. And then you want to get your needles ready, so you want to get a 25 and a 20 to 22 gauge needle as well as a 5mm syringe. That's going to be to draw up the anaesthetic. You then want to get a tongue depressor, so I usually find a metal tongue depressor works best, but you can also have the wooden tongue depressor you want to get a good head torch this is going to give you a really good light source and make sure you can see things properly you want to have a scalpel handy that's going to be if you need to do an incision and drainage you can get some blunt tip forceps in order to open up the um, incised area you want to make sure the patient has a sick bowl or vomit bowl in order to spit out any fluid or blood or pus that comes out you want to get a yanker sucker in order to basically suck away build up a saliva and build up a pus in order to give you a good view and make Make sure that you've got appropriate PPE on and make sure that you're consulting your local trust guidelines, especially during um, this COVID uh, time. So in terms of relevant anatomy, I think it's just important to cover this very briefly because it's quite important when you're doing um, an incision and drainage and also it can be quite scary sticking a needle into the back of someone's throat. So the tonsils are located between the anterior and the posterior pillars of the throat and the lateral wall of the tonsil is adjacent to the um, superior pharyngeal constrictor muscle and basically a peritonsal abscess which essentially on this image you can see here, is located between the tonsillar capsule and also the palatopharyngeus muscle. And the abscess is not within the tonsil, it's separate to the tonsil. Now something that's really important to note is this, and that's the carotid artery, or the internal carotid artery, lies about two and a half centimeters posterior lateral to the tonsil. So if your tonsil's here and your carotid artery's here, you're going to avoid putting the needle in this direction 
you want to make sure that you're sort of going this way rather than across here. So now that you're aware of some of the relevant anatomy, let's just briefly look at how you should be positioning the patient. So ideally you want to position the patient upright with support behind the head to prevent sudden backwards movement and make sure that they're nice and calm. So now I'm going to take you through a step-by-step -step guide of what you need to be doing. So spray the topical anaesthetic and in this image here you can see a potential quinsy around this region. So spray up the back of the throat around here with a topical anaesthetic and wait several minutes for it to take effect. You then want to push the tongue out of the way using the tongue depressor which you can see here and you want to identify the most prominent part of the abscess so i would say somewhere around here is is a good area to start off with you want to inject about two to three mils of anesthetic into the mucosa and you're, you're going to use like a 25 gauge needle to do this and when the anesthetic is injected at the correct depth the mucosa should blanch so it should go like a whitish color which you, i'm just going to try and demonstrate here but it will go like a white color if you've injected it to the right depth and that's because of the epinephrine induced vasoconstriction if you're going to do a needle aspiration this is going to be the first technique that we'll talk about so in a needle aspiration use a 10 mil syringe with about an 18 or 20 gauge needle you want to get a nice wide bore wide gauge needle and that's ordered to get as much pus out as possible and you want to apply continuous suction so with one hand here you're going to be holding the needle and the, the syringe and you're going to be pulling back and you want to direct the needle in the sagittal plane anterior to posterior and not to the side so you want to be going anterior to posterior so in this direction here and you don't want to be sort of putting it in at the side here because of, as we already discussed you're at risk of perforating the carotid artery so you want to aspirate the most prominent area at first and usually that's the superior pole but if no pus is aspirated aspirate the middle and then the inferior pole but don't aspirate the tonsil itself typically you're going to get about two to three or maybe even six mils of pus and you want to be able to send that off for culture so keep the pus then you can see pus coming out here but keep the pus that you've aspirated in the syringe the second technique that you can use is an incision and drainage so you want to warn the patient that pus is going to flow and it must be spat out so use a scalpel with a blade and you want to use tape to cover um, everything basically but the sort of last half a centimeter of the blade so wrap some some tape around here and just leave this bit of the blade open and that's the bit you're going to be using and that's because a common error recalling that anatomy that we covered earlier is that inserting the needle or scalpel blade too deeply is going to risk penetrating the carotid artery and um, if pus isn't really obtained at one centimeter of depth i wouldn't go deeper um, you want to make a small incision so as you can see in this diagram here the incision is being made and then you want to do that over the most prominent area um, you can use a suction catheter to remove the pus and the blood so something like a yanker sucker and you're going to get some bleeding after the incision so, so don't be worried if you get a small amount of bleeding um, you can open up this area using those blunt forceps so you can see in this diagram here just a small area of the blunt forceps are being inserted and you can just slightly prise that area open in order to drain as much pus as possible and then you want to have the patient rinse and gargle with saline or a diluted peroxide saline solution uh, and that's basically it and um, we're now going to cover what you need to do for the aftercare of the patient so in terms of aftercare, once the procedure's finished, observe the patient for an hour or so for complications such as bleeding, and also to ensure that the patient can tolerate fluids. When you're discharging the patient, make sure that you're supplying them with oral antibiotics as per your trust guidelines, and warm saline rinses, and ideally to follow up in 24 hours, although this may not always be possible. Make sure that you appropriately safety net them, providing them with written advice. And patients with excessive bleeding, aspiration, or who are unable to take oral antibiotics usually require prolonged observation or hospitalization. Patients who've had multiple abscesses should usually have elective tonsillectomy after four to six weeks to prevent abscess recurrence. If the patient also presents with multiple episodes of Quincy, you might want to think about imaging and other potential diagnoses. They may be immunocompromised or they might have an anatomical defect or deeper infection. I hope the video was helpful. Please remember to like it if you found it useful and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. And until next time, bye.